Yeah, it's a pleasure to, to, to be here and um, to tell you uh, really some of the... Uh, when Isabella Pasqualini came into the lab and when we, we started discussing this, it's really fantastic to see this, uh, this seminar uh, here today with, uh, with fantastic speakers. So we're, uh, I'm really looking, looking forward to this, to this seminar. So what I would like to do at the beginning is um, to cover... Uh, by the way, can you hear me in the back? Okay, okay. So what, uh, what I try to do is tell you about a link that we, we, we study in the lab between embodiment and self-consciousness. I mean, what bodily mechanisms through embodiment can be uh, for neuroscientists in self-consciousness. So the first part of my talk will be on neuroscience, but very briefly go into this. And then two um, um, yeah, applications of, this, of these insights and, and bi-directional insights, if you want, once between the embodiment of neuroscience for architecture but also, and this is historically a little bit, a bit earlier, also what this means for self-portraiture as a very particular form of, of, um, um, of the, the visual arts. But before starting, if one looks at the term of embodiment, it has been used, I think, in all domains that, that, that we have in academia. Philosophy, if we think about phenomenological approach, Merleau-Ponty, um, um, embodiment is a very important part in psychology, ecological psychology. Maybe Andrea will talk about old Gibson and, and notions like this, and you find it in many forms. I think very simply saying it means involving the body in, 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 a, in a particular form. And um, if we talk about phenomenology or philosophy, very often it, it was, was to show an independence of the brain, that the body is for our brain a way to interact with the world, or the body is actually obviously part of the world, but it's an important interface with the world. Um, however, the, the, the way we have seen it, and there are, there are many other trends in psychology, cognitive science, but also in neuroscience, where the embodiment is rather not seen as the body itself, but of the body representation, how the brain represents the body, and how this representation creates embodiment for experience, consciousness, for perception, and also for thinking. Um, um, or, for example, for visual perception. What's the role of this? body representation in the brain for perception. And this is really what, uh, this is an article by Jesse Prince, which is, which is excellent, he's a philosopher at, at NYU, um, and, and he's, he has taken a very critical view of embodiment, but, but, but it, it's a very nice, nice article. And so, uh, and this is an important point, so proprioception, which is the sense that tells us where our hand or limbs or fingers are in space, is trivially embodied. It's by default embodied, and vestibular system and proprioception very often mentioned, but more interesting questions, maybe more challenging questions, is vision embodied when I see? Is that embodied in a, in a, in a similar way or a different way? Is thought embodied? I mentioned it. What I will, would like to study today is our work. We have looked at how the self and self-consciousness is embodied and how this notion compares to other forms of or other aspects of the self uh, that are important. And then through this link of embodiment to self-consciousness, I'd like to look at architecture and uh, and, and self-portraiture. Um, and of course, I will not go into much detail in, 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 with respect to architecture, because that, that's, of course, Isabella Pasqualini who will present it. So this is a classical map that I think uh, you open any uh, textbook of, of, of neuroscience uh, that you will have seen. So it shows basically a complete map. So this is, uh, for example, the blue region here. This is a view of the brain. You're looking at the left brain. Do we actually have a laser? Uh, yes, point? it's here. Uh -huh. So this is a very classical map. So in this blue part of the brain, which is a, is a section here, you see it as well, there is a complete hemibody or complete body represented once in, in, in the brain. It's basically a one-to-one -one representation to some degree. However, if you look more closely, embodiment from the brain's point of view is not like the physical body, meaning the proportions, because the way this blue region here, 
So this is area through B. So there's actually four different regions in this in this uh, blue region here represents the body if you want in a deformed way. But this is how embodiment from the brain's point of view works compared to to, to our physical body, which of course has smaller arms, smaller lips, and and uh, and, and so on. What is another important point? This blue region is already four different embodiment maps, if you want, four complete maps of the body. So we don't have just one of these little homunculi in our brain, but four. And I think these maps are of relevance for embodiment, but um, our lab focuses on, on, on different maps. I think these are important maps, but for, for, for more complex functions and for embodiment and architecture, they are almost irrelevant, because based on these first descriptions of the body and its state in the world, um, so, uh, um, there is uh, there's other regions, and again we will uh, we will talk about this in uh, in more detail uh, during the day. But the, re the these four body maps that you see here are actually just about touch, just about touch sensations on your skin. But there is the position sense, which is how is your skin oriented in space. There is vision, should you be looking at your body. This certainly changes. And there's sound, because my body can make sound and this can change in space. So where are the areas that integrate these different pieces of information? Seeing, feeling, uh, hearing, of bodily stimuli, where is this integrated? And these are entirely different areas. They are based on input from here, but they're really located in, this, in, in, in these two regions here, so the green and the red area. And those are the regions that, that if you want, in, 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 in my lab, in, in many labs, uh, Andreas Serino's lab, these are uh, regions that, that interest us most for, uh, for, for these reasons that it's an integration. It's the first way how the brain does not passively reflect what it perceives about the body, but also <coughs> integrates other senses about body representation. So one example here, so neurons that you, or brain regions, like this green one here, will also respond not just when you touch, when you perceive touch on your hand, but when you see, uh, I'm not very good at using this, uh, so, so it also responds when the, when the monkey feels approached, or feels a stimulus, or if I would feel a stimulus approaching this pink zone. And I'm, I will be brief here, and Andrea, I'm sure, has more slides upon this, but basically, if this is the, the animal's body, it's a human body, a primate body, this, the body representation and embodiment is not just about the bodily space, it's also about the spatial compartment immediately around it. And there are sounds, close sounds and their close visual stimuli which are massively integrated and the body representation in the brain is not a visual representation it's not this uh, homunculus uh, representation but it's a mixture it's an integrated uh, fuller more complete uh, representation and this is um, we can maybe uh, hopefully discuss it later at the end of this talk is is the brain representation that we mostly work with and one of one of the ways to test it is, is this illusion, so this is the experimenter, this is the experimental subject, it's called the rubber hand illusion, and it's an illusion that's, that puts into conflict what you see, it's much better with sound, but uh, I, I, I will play it again. So it puts in conflict something we take for granted. When I see my hand at a certain position and I feel a touch there, it should come from the same position in space. But this illusion, the simple trick is doing, and you can see it here, this is not the case. So this is the subject, this hand is positioned here, these different maps I mentioned initially are activated here because he receives touch here, but he doesn't see his hand. What he sees is this ridiculously looking fake hand or rubber hand at a different position in space. So you see touch here, but you feel it at a different position. And so this integration maps that I mentioned before, they cannot work properly, so we dissociate those. And this illusion is, is activating, as I, as I mentioned, it relies on these green and red brain areas, and it's one way of testing how the brain really embodies an arm. And for architecture and self-portraiture, what we're interested in is how does, is an avatar that I see, or a hand that I see, or a space that I see, embodied um, by a brain representation. However, we're not studying arm representations, because again, one message uh, this, uh, this, this early afternoon is that this hand or finger representation or the foot representation is not key for architecture, it's rather the representation of the trunk for me as a subject as a whole. And for this one we developed this, this other illusion um, 
um, which uh, I have explained more in this, in, this, in this next slide. So what is happening in this illusion, it's very similar to the rubber hand illusion that I showed you on the slide before, but instead of having a visual stimulus on the hand at a different location than where you have a touch uh, on your hand, we displaced a touch on the back with a touch at the back of an avatar that, that you see or a filmed body of your own body. So this is, this is how, we, how we set this uh, up. So the experimental subject is now here, is wearing a head mount display and the camera, this is standing two meters behind, it's a bit shorter here in this, in this video, but in the original experiment it's the film, it's filmed from two meters behind. This is the head mounted display that we used at the time. And so what this person sees is what the camera sees. So there's then basically also a two meter distance here and you see your own body, virtual body, can be another body, um, that you see two meters in front of you. Because the position of the camera, so what, you, what the camera sees is basically projected here. So very simple setup and very much like the rubber hand illusion what we did is we applied a touch cue to the back so the subject in this orientation feels the touch here on the back but sees it two meters in front. So it's a very similar setup than the, the rubber hand illusion and we were interested in, in two things that had been studied with the rubber hand illusion. Subjective experience. Where do I localize touch? Do I localize touch where I see it? At my hand or at the avatar or do I really localize it at my back? Can I misperceive or mislocalized touch perceptions to, to, the, to the avatar's uh, back position and where is my center of awareness situated after, after this illusion because those were two effects found by the rubber hand illusion and first what we could find, we could quantify several subjective changes during the illusion first of all in this illusion you see I think a video of what the subject sees in here so the stroking is applied here but it's seen two meters in front so you localize touch strongly here but only when, like in this uh, case here, the stroking is applied synchronously. So you see it at the same time when you feel it. If there is a delay between the two, this illusion does not work. And this is shown here. If the stroking between what you see and what you feel is at a different moment in time, uh, sorry, is at the same moment in time, you get a strong illusion. So you displace your perceptions from your body to uh, a different position in, in space, in this case an avatar, and when the stroking, feeling a touch here and seeing it here at a different moment in time is desynchronized, this does not occur. What is, made is, is, is what's interesting or most interesting at the time, you could say, oh, these are subjective changes. Of course, we control them through, through experimental conditions. But if we ask people after this illusion, if they have been exposed to the illusion here, and we displace them and we ask them to indicate the position where they have been standing during the illusion, they don't walk to the correct position, they just walk too far and they walk predictably far, namely into the direction of the visual <coughs> avatar. So there's a dominance, if you want, of the visual embodiment mechanism over the touch embodiment mechanism. So there's this, this link here. Um, again, happy to discuss more, more details about this. Um, again, one of the main roles in the lab is really to find out and, and to describe in detail the dedicated uh, processes in this area, which part is doing the visual processing, which one is doing the touch processing, and most of all, which, which area is the one doing um, the integration. So in order to uh, summarize this, this first part, um, so there's basically two bodies that we present. There's a visual body or an avatar in this scenario. There's our experimental subject or visitor of a museum or visitor of a space or uh, spectator in front of uh, self-portraiture if you want and when we induce this illusion applying touch uh, stimuli here and seeing it at a different location the brain learns to integrate and project bodily feelings towards the scene position so there is the sensation that touch that you see applied here is felt two meters in front of you which of course physically is not possible you identify uh, with this avatar and you have a projection your center of awareness is shifted from here several centimeters into this direction. So basically, in this illusion, we start making errors where, about something we shouldn't make errors. Where's our center of awareness right now? Well, it must be somewhere in a volume around my position right now, but somehow this volume shifts, shifts forward and we can control this to some degree uh, in, the, in the research lab. But I think that's not all. I think many important, so this is more than self-protection because many important changes also happen um, for the observer's body. The only change is not just that I feel with respect to the body differently, but this is also changed here. For example, if you measure pain thresholds during these illusions, those pain thresholds are higher, 
so it takes longer before I say ouch mm -hmm. as a subject but it means that how I perceive pain has changed I perceive less pain here if I'm embodying the avatar in front there's also temperature changes which may be interesting why is the body cooling down I perceive um, less pain I, I'm, I'm, I'm cooled down and, and, and there's other physiological changes so embodying somebody else comes with consequences for the, the touch representation and the motor representation um, here. I think even immunological responses have been shown to change. And so I think this notion, I will not go in, into detail concerning architecture, but it's a bi-directional change. That's uh, something I think I put on the slide here. It is not just a projection from here, into the space or into the avatar or into that region where the avatar is shown, there's also an impact of what I see on my body representation, for example. Important work of a colleague from Karolinska has shown that if this avatar is receiving visual threat, my body right here reacts differently. Maybe an architecture experiment would be um, that the architecture creates the threat. So if there is a virtual space built around here or if the Pantheon is built around here and changes some structures, is a threat response or any other physiological response changed. More, some aspects that Andrea Serino and I are, are very interested in, it's, it's very detailed, so we're really trying to, under, or to come up with laws, how this bodily self-consciousness works, how the embodied self, like I presented it now, works, because what, what, what I believe, and I'm, I'm happy to look forward to discussing it with you, is this very fundamental feeling of where we are located in space, and whether we identify with this, with volume in space, um, we, you know, work has been shown, our work, much other work as well, that it depends on, 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 on these uh, different kind of uh, factors, of which one is called embodiment, um, other ones is how the visual information uh, you are exposed to is, is shaped, how the avatar is positioned. Obviously, in a scenario like this, the experiment I presented to you before, the, the, the subject's body was like this and the avatar's body was in the same body orientation. However, if the body is shifted like this, the illusion works less strongly so. So there needs to be this congruency or this uh, mirroring between um, body posture that is seen and body posture that is felt. Otherwise, the brain does not integrate or does not start to, to, to resonate. Anyway, so these are effects that, uh, that we, are, we are very interested in. And so to, to also sum up this part again, of course the self and bodily self or self-consciousness relies on many other factors, cognitive factors, memory, language, concepts we have about ourselves. However, we pursue the hypothesis that the body representation is the most fundamental one. It's also one that we share uh, with animals. And in, in, in a nutshell, so this is again that this multisensory integration of bodily signals is the most fundamental self uh, reference brain representation for self-consciousness and to put this in a historical perspective here I cannot go into detail but of course this is based on much previous work uh, Antonio Damasio for example uh, Ramachandra from San Diego Chris Frith in, in London and Marc Genovo in, in Lyon have all worked on very similar notions the link to the self or to this trunk related representation of the self however uh, has been has been lost, less strongly proposed so in the end so, so what we really work on, based on this previous work, we're, we're trying to understand how really this trunk, maybe hand representation, but essentially this trunk rep representation has a very primitive, even Drosophila had such a representation. But it is the unique and most global representation of the body we have with respect to space. So, so we, we mostly study um, this representation, but if you look at the field of neuroscience again, I think even about embodiment, most of the people look at fingers, maybe arm representations or even hand movements. So it's like as if, uh, like the visual system studies the fovea a lot and the central part of vision, my field of, of neuroscientists of the body and the embodiment seem to focus very much on, on, on fingers and, and hands, which from my perspective are not the crucial elements to understand how I am embodied in, 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 in the world. So, to, so Isabella will talk uh, more about this. So we started this work in order to, to, to better, to, to first of all study multi-sensory mechanisms in architecture, to go away from only space perception or only visual perception, that was a tremendously rich liter literature already, but to see how this multi-sensory way of seeing the body can be of interest uh, uh, for architecture. Um, 
And one goal was, of course, to facilitate, maybe by understanding how this relationship between me and the space that I'm in uh, is, is studied, to, to also see how this can facilitate or augment the experience or the design of, of such uh, environments. So one study that uh, Isabella will talk about showed that how this um, projection works into different architectural spaces. So one, one uh, condition she compared is how does the surrounding of the avatar, here you see the, um, the, the, the own body filmed in a, standing in a large space versus a very narrow space, does the space around the avatar change how you do embodiment? And other forms is uh, how can I really project myself into the space? So it is again this bi-directional projection and, and what's the relevance for, <coughs> for architecture. So again here, uh, I think uh, th there will be more talk about this as well. Of course, we're standing uh, on, on, on the shoulders of, of other people. I, I mentioned just Vischer and, and Valflin here who, who, um, who had made similar notions, I think, at the end of the 19th century based on a lot of physiological research and oculomotor eye movement-based research um, which actually, by the way, especially eye movements may have a particular link to this, to this trunk and head representation. So this is just one room um, that Isabella uh, has worked with, so visual tactile rooms. Um, another room is a cardiovisual room, which is another form how we can use, and so far I neglected it, but time is short, also interoceptive representation, heartbeat signals, breathing patterns, um, are an essential part of the body itself, and so, we, uh, we have used it here in this one uh, scenario. Okay, five more minutes. So it's um, so this is work that um, <coughs> instead of architecture, a question I had since we work with avatars and we are interested in self uh, representation in the brain, how how can this maybe be of relevance for having a different form of linking to to the visual arts, in particular self portraits? Um, there is very classical self-portraits like this one, but what, what is closely linked maybe to the multisensory approach is when, there's not, when the painter would not just show himself or visually show himself once, but maybe twice or three times in the same picture, as, as in this famous uh, picture from Caravaggio maybe, so I'll have a next slide with, with more in, input on this. And if you compare Rembrandt's self-portrait in the atelier with a very distant view of himself, with a certain profession and of course showing exactly who he is, it's very different than this more archetypical type of self portraiture which is a, 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 a more like a, a, a bust-like like way of showing us. And of course Velázquez uh, played masterfully with, with this rotation of having a mirror, of having a perspective on yourself and, and, and looking back basically um, at yourself. So this idea of perspective changes and, and where the self really is, 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 is I think a very a fascinating uh, uh, problem that is dealt with here. It's a, it's a, it's a nice self-portrait by Escher, who again shows there's a visual component to it, there's a felt component here, and, and you can ask, of course, yourself whether Escher is here looking out or whether Escher is standing in front looking into the picture. Surrealism, and here we start to have really these back views. What is a back view self-portrait? Normally we have to show the face, but what does the painter what is the painter trying to convey by showing yourself from the back? This is René Magritte, uh, La Reproduction Interdite, standing in front of a mirror, and then in the mirror, this is even enhanced. Instead of seeing a reflected front face, you continue seeing this. So this is, in the Romantic area, also 19th century, the back figure was actually quite, quite an important um, part. So again, I just briefly uh, mentioned this here, but there are links also with respect to Bruce Naumann to this illusion um, that we had. So whether you show a self-portrait with front-facing or with back-facing, the artist may or wish to convey um, on different aspects. Let me skip this one. So this is um, briefly worked by, by Nicole Ottinger, who went one step further, and what we, we uh, did to, or worked together with uh, Nicole <coughs> was to see whether she can use our setup, and she, or she was actually interested in using our video AgroZoom setup to paint or draw, sketch self-portraits. So she was wearing the device, and this is shown in the next uh, video here, that I just let play like this, and this is the synchronous condition, so basically she's standing between what she's drawing and between the camera, just like our experimental subjects before, and then of course she's blindfolded except that her eye see, sees what the camera behind herself is seeing. So this kind of loop 
that we're trying to study also in architecture can, I think, also be studied in, uh, in, in, in paintings of the own, of the own person. And in particular, those conditions who were desynchronized were most interesting for, for Nicole um, at this time. So these are just two of the, the sketches uh, she made. So this is a natural tendency for her to draw herself them twice. So this is a, a one image she, she, she showed. And at some point, she also started using a mirror in order to also visualize and she could see herself better because otherwise when she wanted to see herself while she was painting the drawing here, she had to turn around, uh, look at herself and then turn back around. So she could never see herself uh, while, while she was painting the image. And so this blindfolding um, um, was, was particularly interesting for her. The last, how much uh, time do I have? I think I have two more slides. Um, so, next to embodiment, I think there is one other component that is, is, is maybe important to mention, and this is the situatedness. So, we're not just embodied in a way, or with the term embodiment comes also that our cognition and perception is situated. It is situated somewhere in, in space. And again, Jesse Prince dissociates this and separates this from, uh, from embodiment per se, but in the difference that we identify with the body and that cognition and perception may be linked uh, to processing of the body, consciousness is also situated with respect to other humans, but also with respect to the environment. Um, consciousness is situated um, as being conscious, as, as conscious in the way that we, sorry, what is this, there's a problem here. Being located in a physical environment makes a contribution to our mental capacity, so it means not just being in a body, but also being in a space that is surrounding you, also impacts you, um, your perceptions and your vision. And I think this notion of situatedness even more um, links, to, um, links to, um, to architecture. And we have seen this already, this is again this recalibration, this positional recalibration change. We did not simply identify more or less with the avatar, we were shifted towards the avatar. So our situatedness in space has also changed. It's not by definition where the body is physically. It can be where the brain represents the body to, me, uh, to, to be. And this is, was most strongly shown maybe by work that we did a, a while ago on so-called out-of-body experiences where stimulation at certain regions or interference uh, with this region can lead not just to a translation, to a forward translation, but also to a displacement in a completely different part away from the body, which is also associated with the rotation. And I think those aspects may link to entirely different aspects of architecture, mostly about what is the perspective that I have at a certain environment. We seem to take it for granted that the only perspective, the true first-person perspective I can have is visual. But I think these, uh, these data here, which uh, are partly reproduced also in, in, in the research lab show, that actually other non-visual perspectives can take over because we will have not just a visual first-person perspective, but also an auditory or some other sensory first-person perspective. And I think the perspective, maybe the ideal perspective that was, was looked for, a subjective perspective, is not just a visual sense, uh, some other sensory or auditory one, but an integrated uh, perspective. So, so I think some of these illusions and multi-sensory paradigms I presented also relate uh, to this uh, other perspective. Yeah, so this is basically a summary slide, so embodiment and situatedness, two aspects that can we, we, we studied. Self-consciousness, which is the notion I focused on, is embodied and situated. It depends on multisensory uh, mechanism that I described. The trunk is, is the, the key reason, and, and uh, I hope that, uh, that uh, experimental work, but also theoretical work, will have a look at how this can be of use for architecture and the visual arts. Thank you.